you've been involved in a plane crash and that your mum, dad and Gomnesh, that's my brother, are no more. And I remember looking in the mirror, but then everything was like, oh my God, who is that? It was doctrined in me. Who's going to marry you? Who's going to look at you? Got no prospects. You're not going to get a job because of the way you look. I know why these things happen to me. It's so I can give other people inspiration, hope. I don't care if you find me beautiful or not. I don't care if you call me beautiful or not. It doesn't make a difference. I know I am. In today's world, there are so many incredible and extraordinary stories of survival. Stories about fighting against the odds, overcoming the toughest situations and never giving up. Stories that need to be told and heard. Stories that can change our perspective on life, offer us empowerment, teach us how to deal with difficulties and give us inspiration to find inner strength. My name is Iris Enthoven and you're now listening to They Survived. In this week's episode, we journey into the life of Tulsi, who was involved in a plane crash at the age of 10 in the rough terrain of Nepal. The traumatic event took the lives of her mother, father and brother. Waking up alone with 45% of her body burned left her with both emotional and physical scars. After years of ridicule and rejection, she's now fighting for all those with facial disfigurements. Happy to have you here. Thank you for joining us today. Hi. Yeah, can you start by telling a little bit more about your childhood and your life before the plane crash? Sure. Um, so yeah, before my accident, um, I was like a really happy girl, you know, really popular in the playground. And I was very sociable, very sporty, um, very happy. I was that kind of girl who was fighting injustices in the playground. If I saw a bully, you know, bullying somebody, I'd stand up to them. And, you know, I was quite boisterous. So I liked hanging around with a lot of male people in my family. It's like I enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. I was just a happy-go-lucky girl, you know, very sociable. So I think for me, it's difficult to transition from that kind of energy to what then happened after my accident. Yeah, because you went on this trip with your family. Uh, what was the purpose of the trip? Yes, I went on this holiday with my family. My dad decided he's going to take me and my brother to India, which is where he's from. And he wanted us to show a life of what it's actually like in the real world. Because in London, you know, we're very privileged, nice house, um, whatever we wanted, we got. Yeah. You know? um, so we were lucky. So I think my dad wanted to show us real life of poverty how other people do live and what we should be grateful for. Yeah, because he was from India. <clears throat> his family also lived there? Yeah, so he had his granddad there. Okay. And he hadn't seen his granddad for 23 years. Oh my God. So he's like, let me go and see him and then we'll see the whole of India. Yeah. And this is a great time because before I start high school, yeah, it's the perfect time. Yeah. So we were excited because it's the first time on the plane. And at that time, we used to have to go to a travel agent to get brochures. You know, it wasn't online, obviously. Yeah, really old school. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we had to go in and the first brochure we saw was Goa. So we saw beaches. So when my dad's saying, you know, there's poverty and things like that, we just couldn't picture it because in the brochures, it looked all fancy and blue sea and palm trees. So when we were there, we got to see my granddad, well, my great granddad. Were you the first time seeing him, right? Yes, yeah. it was the first time, really beautiful you know really beautiful man and just loving a great time and then we our luggage had got delayed so we had to go back to um at the time it was called Bombay but Mumbai to pick up our luggage and whilst we were there my dad decided let's tour the south of India before we go back to the village again which yep. is on the west coast so we went to Mumbai and in my brother and my sort of mind we were going to go Goa Oh, yeah. So we're like, yes, finally we get to go to this beach. And, you know, we did see the poverty in Mumbai. You know, you see a lot of it. But yes, great. Now, finally, that brochure image is going to be real. Yeah. And then, how old were you at this point? Um, 10 at the time. Ten, yes. So then my parents are saying, OK, we're going to somewhere called Bangalore. Now, at that time, me and my brother are like, who is this person? Because we didn't even know it was a city. And we're like, who is this person? We've never heard of this person so reluctantly, I remember holding on to sort of railing going, no, we don't want to get on the plane. I don't want to go. And my brother was the same. Obviously, we got on the plane. And then him being the youngest, he got to sit by the window. So I remember fighting with him saying, it's not fair. And why do why do the younger siblings always get their way? And, and I was in the middle seat and my dad was in the aisle 
and then my mum was in the aisle next next to us and I remember fighting and then literally the next thing is I hear my grandmother's voice now I left my grandmother back in the UK so her voice is very clear it wasn't like at the end of a phone back in the days when the lines were really bad to be shouting you know it was very clear and my grand's that kind of woman who doesn't doesn't show emotions so here she was crying and I was like why is she crying so in my head I thought she's come to surprise us because in my head I'm still on the plane yes. and I'm still fighting with my brother at this point I'm in the hospital my grand's saying to me now Dulce you've been involved in a plane crash and that your mum dad and Gumnesh that's my brother are no more and that you look different but in my head she's on the plane so how can I look different if I'm on the plane mm. I'm fighting with my brother yeah so the information didn't um, soak through really to be honest so it was like what is she saying and then the next voice I hear is a young medic voice obviously a complete stranger saying Dulce don't worry I'm going to take care of you uh, the doctors and the nurses are on the airfield attending to the casualties I don't know what that means I'm like what is he saying yes um because again now in my head he could be the air steward serving us tea and coffee on the plane yeah because you were also not able to see anything right no. so it was only like voices absolutely yes it was just voices my eyes were bandaged I was in and out of sedation mm. you know and obviously no doubt shock as well you know the whole thing put together from the time of my accident to my grandparents getting there it was literally the next day so how those 24 hours went I don't know. Yeah, you know, know nothing about those hours. No. So when I hear my grand's voice, it like mm. I said I thought I'm still on the plane. And of course in the hospital is noisy so on the plane it's noisy so it felt consistent. And then I'm flown back to the UK at this point where I'm now met with another family. Again I can't see so I'm in and out of sedation. Um this family are speaking to me and they're telling me like they've pulled me out of the plane. and that we're traveling back to London together don't worry we're going to look after you we're okay again i don't they're not familiar to me what is going on his family was also in the same accident plane. yeah Excellent, yeah and we'd never met them but when my family arrived in india and their family had arrived in india at the same time they got talking and there was some connection formed and clearly they trusted that family to take me to um england with them um arrived in England arrived at RAF Northolt from there I was transported um by ambulance to a burns unit in Essex um and there I'm now met with my other family members aunties uncles and cousins and they deliver the same news as my gran just straight away every time repeating the yeah, same like they just said the same things yes. so i when i heard their voice i heard, i was excited because Like I said, I was very sociable, very family orientated. Yes. So when I heard that, heard their voices, it's familiarity, it's comfort. But when they're delivering the same information, obviously it's not sinking in, but it's like, what is going on? So now in my head, I thought they've come to surprise me in the plane. So I still haven't comprehended that I'm in England yet. Ah, uh, because you were still wearing the bandages, yes. right? Yes. I'm still in and out of sedation. And were you like asking, can I take this off? Can I see anything or No, um, no. because I I didn't even know what was going on because I was under medication so uh, yes. to you know to sort of help with the pain and the shock. Yes. So when they told me the same information, I was like, what is going on here? Now, bearing in mind from the time I've come back to London, it's probably about now three days post accident. I have no concept of time. Whilst I'm in hospital, I'm in and out of um theater, like having my treatment, being treated for smoke inhalation, you know, burns, obviously burn scars, um skin grafts, plastic surgery, you know, you name it. Yes, for how many percent you were burnt? Um 45% to 45%. my face and body. Yes. Um a lot of smoke inhalation of course. Yes. Um fracture on my arm. But where I was under sedation and obviously lots of painkillers. I'm not aware of when I'm in theater out of theater if I'm in pain I'm not in pain I, I had no you know no memory of that no it's every time I woke up when I heard a family member's voice is the only memories I have it's about three or four weeks post accident now where um 
the opportunity to take the bandages off now, you know, finally, because all the treatments, not were complete, but at that stage were done. Yes. So when the doctors, and well, the nurse said, you know, would you like to see yourself in the mirror? And I said, of course I would, because I was excited. Yeah. Because in my head, nothing has happened. It's, it's so crazy. You, uh, for a 10-year-old gl- girl, that your head, you're still the same, but everyone's telling you there's something different. Absolutely. Yeah. And I still felt like Dulce inside, yeah. you know, because everyone around me came to visit me, my cousins and everyone, they tried to keep everything normal. Mm-hmm. But of course, they can see that's not the Dulce they know, because obviously I do look different. But they're trying to keep it all normal for me, you know, everything consistent. And I was so excited to see myself, because what could change? What For a 10-year-old, what does change mean? I mean, I wasn't allowed to dye my hair, so it can't be my hair colors different. Mm-hmm. Maybe somebody's cut my hair or maybe, you know, I might be wearing something else that I would yeah. not normally wear. Like yeah, yeah. I had it very, you know, I just was very simple in my head. Anyway, the day came when, you know, they removed the bandages and I was excited and they were nervous. I could feel the energy of the, you know, the, the, the nurse and doctors. They've obviously said later on that I don't think you realize the gravity of that moment because you're, you were just excited to see yourself. Yes. But we were nervous. So they were there, they sat with me. Was it with family or only with the nurses? Yeah, just yeah. with the nurse and the doctor. Yes. And I remember looking in the mirror. Like I said, I was so excited. But then everything was like, oh my God, who is that? And then because the person I was, I was like a prankster, you know, I used to do lots of pranks mm-hmm. and jokes. So I thought somebody drew that face on because no one can look like that. That's It looked like a joke, basically. Because my face was red or raw, I had no hair, you know, my hair was shaved off. Yes. Um, obviously, there's burns on my face now. And then when I looked down at my left hand, it was like very red raw, there was bandages, and there was metal rods sticking out the fingers to straighten them. Yes, because that happens right with, <clears throat> with the... Yeah, with any accident. Yeah. Well, kind of any accident, it, you know. So yeah, they put metal rods, so I looked down and I was like, Okay, I don't know. There's something. Something's happened. Yes. But I still couldn't connect the dots. And then I looked at myself in the mirror again, and I thought, Oh my God, the person in the mirror who's moving her eyes and her mouth—that's me. Oh my God, this is me. Wow, I do look different. Mm-hmm. When I looked back at my hand again, I don't know if it was maybe naive. I was optimistic, but I thought in a year's time, I mean, this magic cloth and everything's going to disappear. Yeah. And my attitude to life has always been, it's no big deal. So I was like, okay, it's no big deal. It'll be gone in a year. There's nothing to worry yeah. about, you know. So that's how I got through that moment. Being in hospital, being around my family, everyone is just treating me as Dulce now, right? Like, there's no difference. They're not treating me different. They're not treating me any special. They're not looking at me differently. Was there like this moment, because this was the first time you're seeing yourself, with, was there like already a realization moment? Also, what happened to your family, or to, did it took more days? Or yeah, it took way longer than that. Like even in that moment, I still didn't connect that I was in an accident. Yeah, I still didn't connect that my parents aren't here. In my head, everything is still normal. Yeah. So in your head, you were also thinking they come back. Yeah, or, I thought oh. they're just in a room next door. I didn't think anything has still happened at this point. Yeah, because the pain is one, and that's so sad. But I think it's also so sad for a ten-year-old girl to. Yeah, miss her family in one split second. Yeah, absolutely. It was emotionally, I could... Yeah. But I think, you know, that's the thing about our minds, like, it can protect us or, you know, it can destroy us, I think, you know. It's mm-hmm. one of those, and I think in my case, it protected me Yeah, a lot. So, yeah, where I was treated like Dulce in hospital, I thought, you know, the whole world is going to be like this. Yeah. So now when I leave hospital after all my treatments, I was there, what, four months? And I left and I thought, okay, great. I'm going to go back into the world and I'm just going to be Dulce again. Yeah. And that's where reality did start because that's where I now realized I am different because the way people treated me, you know, name calling. How was this? How, do, how did people treat you? Yeah, like so they'd cross the road in case they caught something from me. Oh, really? Yeah. Like avoiding you? Yeah, like avoiding me. So, you know, a bit oh. like the pandemic when yeah. we were so scared to... Look touch at people, people touch yeah. people, and it, it, that's what it was like. Oh, that's so sad as a young exactly. So girl, now not only going through what I've gone through, I'm now is- feeling isolated, and then the name calling starts. You know, ugly, disgusting. You know, 
so people many on the street were yelling yeah, absolutely yeah. yes walking just like past. like uh, straight away or yeah I walking imagine. past i know it, it, it to say it now it seems so surreal yeah but it's like people walking past and they're like oh my god did you look at her she's so disgusting or like wow have you seen that ugly girl there and you know they're talking about you were it like children or more most adults children adults? yeah and then it's crazy it's, it is really it. yeah. crazy and then so yeah the name calling there's so much bullying it's the journey to and from school obviously it's in the community it's the journey to and from hospital but school was my safe place mm -hmm. I had amazing school time amazing support great friends so I how felt was it safe. for your friends because yeah you were away for months and coming back it w I can imagine yeah yeah it's, it's also like a little shock absolutely because I left in February you know 1990 I got discharged in June, mm -hmm. so I had one month left of my primary school, so I had a day out to visit the school, so I got to see some of my friends, and of course it's a shock for them, because that's not the Tulsi they remember, but you know, imagining somebody who's 10, 11 at the time, how do they navigate their friend looking different, Yeah, and then still trying to keep it normal, I, you know, I commend them, honestly, mm -hmm. even now it still amazes me. I still have some of those friends now. You know, I've asked them, how would you cope? They said, well, you're our friend, so... Yeah, of course. But I, I can imagine they were also, like, worried about Absolutely. you. Like, about your health and... And it is. Your friend looks different. How do you navigate that, right? Because no one teaches you how to navigate this. But they all use their inner instincts and just supported me, which is amazing, you know, yeah. to think they all had that sort of strength in yeah. that time. Um. So how was it for you at such a young age really get pulled out this like carefree uh, life as a yeah 10 year old girl next to all your friends actually it's very surreal um i think i was angry because i couldn't be like my friends carefree i have to go home i have to attend to my bandages i have to go hospital you know it's not normal for me so while they're in the classroom and playing the sports and doing all the, ch um, you know, football tournaments, mm -hmm. I couldn't be involved. And it was frustrating because I used to love football. Yes. You know, I was captain of the team or, you know, the goalkeeper, whatever it was. And suddenly I couldn't do any of that. You know, and I felt left out. My friends didn't make me feel left out. But I felt left, left out because I couldn't participate in yes. this. Um, I mean, not, you know, if things were probably going on for them at home, of course, but the carefree child attitude, I couldn't do that because I have to go home and parent myself. I have to go home and face my reality, which was no family. Like, you know, I haven't got my family. It's not my, when I left in February, I'd go home to my parents and fight with my brother and do our homework and eat together. And Were you close with your family? Absolutely. You know, very loving family, very My parents in that time and generation, especially in our culture, you know, they don't show emotions and it's not hot, you know, hugs and things, but my parents did. Okay. So I witnessed them holding hands. I witnessed them kissing. I witnessed them hugging. Yes. But culturally, that's not a thing. So I've seen love. I've seen pure unconditional love to then have it taken away. So like I wasn't coming home to love. You know, I was, it was very... Obviously, my grandparents are a different generation. They're very, they don't show emotion. There's no hugs and hearts and flowers. It's just very practical. Or distance. Yeah. And so I just come home from school. Yeah. And that's it. And your family, were they, were they supportive? Because you also lost your whole family. Yeah, they were supportive in the sense of they did all sort of the day-to-day -day things. and But I think emotionally, coming from a South Asian culture, the attitude is now this has happened... It's kind of like, now get over it. Mm. There's nothing to talk about. You just move on. So there was not enough space to really talk about emotions. Absolutely. Like, oh. if I cried, it was like, oh my God, why are you crying? What's there to cry about? Oh, really? So then I sort of internalized a lot. So I couldn't share. So when I had these bullying episodes, like if I shared it with a friend, I said, you know, so this happened. They're like, oh, it's also, don't worry about it. It's just the way they are. Oh, And yeah. because you look different expect this so uh, now already it's almost like i've lined my mind up to say this is acceptable behavior it's almost like 
I didn't have support. And I know they were trying their best to just make me feel like, don't worry, it's okay. But that wasn't healthy as well because yeah. then I couldn't share anything. So I kept everything inside. That's where I was suffering in silence. It was a hard way. Yeah. yeah. Where, where were you living at this moment? Um, in East London. Yeah, so but it, not with your family No, anymore? with my grandparents. Grandparents, yes. Yeah, so I was in, I grew up in East London and I wanted to live there because of yeah. my school and everything. So I was with my grandparents. So it's a very different generation. South Asian culture, like I said, you know, everything's, nothing connect, connected to emotions. You mm. know? So they're very devout of emotions. So I suffered in silence basically yes growing up but for your grandparents as well because they also lost their kids absolutely yeah everyone's got pain you know and loss here where are there points you were really missing your family i think it's more now mm -hmm. than when i was younger because like for me i'm just getting through it just get through the day get through the year get through this you know i've got through life that way yes it's like i said not dealing with the emotion mm -hmm. now it's when i see a friend with their mom or their dad, it's then that I'm realizing what I've missed out on. When their mom and dad or a guardian or parent figure does something for them just because they do, realizing I've had to do that myself. Just simple things like make them a sandwich if they're hungry. Yes. You know, like I've had to do it myself. So that would be nice. Yeah. You know, when you're tired, you go home and there's a meal there. Like it would... Just things like that. Like I now appreciate that parental, what I'm missing out on basically. Because now, I don't know, your grandparents are still alive? Yeah, my granddad, yeah. Oh, okay. So I still live with him. Yeah, so you still have sort of family. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's really nice. Yeah, yeah. and I still got family, like aunties, uncles, cousins yeah. and stuff. But um, yeah, I still got my granddad. But it's just that missing that parental figure which I denied myself. Yeah. Because my thing was, well, if they're not here, I don't need them. So it's fine. Yes. But that was just a bravado. Were you able to go to the funerals? No, no. because we, in Hindu, so I grew up as Hindu, um, they cremate. Uh, so as yes. soon as my grandparents had got there, there was like a big mass cremation because, of course, so many bodies they couldn't even identify, obviously. What kind of plane was it? Do you know what? What was the cause of the plane crash? No, it was... They never no, re-investigated. Ne never found out. So it was um, like a domestic flight. Yeah. On a daily basis, do you like often still deal with the plane crash? Is it like, are you scared to fly? Ah, great question. Um, no, I'm not scared to fly. Um, I love traveling. Unless I start getting on a boat now, which probably will take me <laughs> ages to get anywhere. I enjoy flying. I enjoy, I enjoy traveling. For me, traveling is getting to meet people, different cultures how they live, how can I better my life? Yes. Um, so how was the first time flying again? Was um, it I was nervous, I'm not going to lie. Yeah. Um, it was three years post-accident. But my thing is, like I just did a prayer as we took off and a prayer as we land. And I just do that now anyway. I, you know, Even if yeah. it's an hour's flight or 10 hour flight, it's just what I do. Yeah. And every time we land, I, you know, I'll always ensure to say thank you to the pilot and just thank you, you know, just my gratitudes. Do you know why you survived it? Is there any explanation why you survived it? I feel for me spiritually, it's something I had to do mm -hmm. um, because I'm very much about purpose and I'm very soul driven. It's, that's what I mean. I knew I had to go through this journey yes. to be where I am today. But there's no like some technical explanation for like sometimes it's like nope. because people are over there or there's nope. no... Um, because where I was sat, it wasn't even about that, you know, because so many people who sat similar area to me, you know, they passed. So oh, yeah. in terms of energetically, I can only put it down to it's something I had to go through. Yeah. Um, because the way... That gentleman from that family had rescued me from the plane. So he rescued you. C could you tell us a little bit more about Absolutely. his story? Because you were like blacked out. Yes. Yeah, so I. You know everything. What yeah. Happened. He he was aware. Yeah. He was conscious. It's the reason. So he was pulling people out of the plane. Obviously, trying to get his family first, of course. So there was like this big fire, and he yes. was getting in the fire to. Yeah. So it's obviously, I don't know the situation in how he happened to be there or like what was going on yes. but he's going to find his family pulls his da younger daughter out because she's just there sits her to the side finds his wife puts takes her out now looking for his other daughter 
finds her underneath me. So I'm on top of her. So in order to get to her, he has to pull me out and then obviously pull her out. She has 96% burns and smoke inhalation. So you can imagine, you know, I had a lot of fire there. I'm on top of her. So everything I've got is on the front yes. of my body and face. So this has pulled me out, it's pulled her out. I'm sure he's rescued a handful of more people. What a hero that he, oh, he went in the fire to help people. Complete and in that position to be able to do yeah, it. Yeah, like I can imagine you're doing it for your family, but doing it for more people. Absolutely. If you rescued your family and after that go in again. Right. That's so it's amazing. Yeah. And then eventually, like they, you know, they took him to hospital and yeah. then he did they had a moment of being unconscious and then conscious. Yes. But yeah, so he he rescued me and I don't know how I would have survived or why in terms of technical reason. Yes. But in terms of why out of my family, it's because everything my parents taught me, even though by the age of 10, you don't really know what they've taught you because you're still a child. But everything they've taught me has served me to this point. Yes. Independency, parenting myself, yeah. looking after myself. But the reason he, he, he took you is also the reason maybe you survived because... Like, he didn't took your brother or your fa- parents, right? He, oh. I don't know where oh. they were. They, you know, they could have been flung out of the plane. I don't know. Yes. He wouldn't have known. He He's pulling people, whoever he could. Oh, yeah, of course, yeah. Because um, some who've probably passed, probably dead already. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Like, I don't know. Have you ever did, like, therapy going back to the moment? I've not had any therapy. <laughs> you don't have I've any? never had therapy. Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah. I've done it myself. Yeah. You really had to do it the hard way. I've had to do it yeah. the hard way. Because there is like a therapy going back to the moment because like you're, you don't know anything about it. Yeah. Sometimes it could also be like a mechanism to yeah. not deal so with I've it. So never, I've never said to myself, flashbacks may never happen. I'm, yeah. I'm very aware. One day I could wake up and it could. Yes. I don't know. But I've done a lot of meditations where I've visited the site myself in meditation. Yes. And I've made peace. I've... I haven't had any flashbacks of like, you know, bouncy or things coming. I haven't had anything like that. I had nothing in my dreams. But I've I've also said, never say never. Yeah. I'm not like going to sit here and say, oh, no, no, I've dealt with it. I'm fine. No, it can happen. Because the mind, the brain is, is phenomenal. Yeah. I don't discount it. When it happens, it will happen. And if it doesn't, it may never. Yeah, it's just sense. all I know is I have visited the site there in my meditation and I've witnessed everything as how it's happened and I've made peace that way. At what point you was really like, oh, this happened to me? Yeah, I think I was 13. Well, I got to visit the the site. Mm-hmm. So three years after my accident, my grandparents took me to India. Again, we went to visit my great granddad and things like that. They did say, if ever you do visit Bangalore, come and see us. We'd love to show you around the airport and so I did get to go to the site where the accident happened. Oh, really? So it's on. So it land. It was on landing that the accident happened. As you're tra- as we were traveling from the airport out to the runway, they had the plane wreckage on the side. But when I saw the wreckage, it didn't feel familiar. It didn't look like that's what I was in. Mm-hmm. Completely detached. Then this little bus took us to the spot. Now this spot. It's just a concrete slab. There's nothing like X marks the spot. There's nothing fancy. There's nothing like something happened or a plaque. It's just concrete. Yes. But when I went to la- um, lay a wreath, like we took a wreath there, I started crying because I felt something. It almost like my soul knew something's happened here. Yes. So I started to cry, and that's the first time since the accident to that point <clears throat> excuse me, that I've actually cried with so much pain. Yeah. There's nothing there. No, but there was something. But energetically, yeah. I could feel something's happened. The pain, what happens, yeah. Um, so we laid the wreath. I've come back to London after all of this. And I remember saying to my auntie one day, because in the back of my head, I kept convincing myself they will come back. They've lost their passport. Because they're in India, it's difficult to get a passport. Maybe my parents have all lost each other and they're finding each other. Then they'll come back to London. So in my head, that's what was going on. I see this concrete slab and I was like, 
something has happened, but I still haven't, I still haven't said to myself, they've gone. Yeah. So when I come back to London, maybe a year later, maybe a couple of months later, I said to my auntie and I said, I think it's not the passport they lost. I think they've gone. And that's when I realized that they're not here. Because yeah. up until this point, it was easy to believe they've lost their passport. Yeah, it was sort of hope. It was hope, yeah. yeah. Um, and when like, my grandparents made a call to India, I feel like they were talking to them. Yes, I understand. Yeah, because um, although I know they weren't, yeah. but it feels like when they make a call to India, it feels like they're talking to them. Yeah. But it's when I come back and starting to piece together that something has happened. That must have felt so hard for you. Yeah, I think it's more, okay, they're not here, but I'm going to be fine. Yeah. Because like I said, I had this thing of no big deal. I think no big deal has got me through so much in life. But that doesn't mean I didn't have pain and trauma. I think obviously I suppressed it. That's where the problem was. Yeah. When did it came out? Because at, that, at this point it was, okay, let's move on. Let's continue. Mm -hmm. But maybe in your life there was a certain point, like all the emotion came out maybe when you grew older yeah no absolutely so where the emotions were trapped so i did abuse alcohol and i did abuse drugs you know mm. from a young age but at the end of a coke line at the end of a bottle i was still not happy and i still i was still lost was it sort of escapism yeah it was an escapism yeah. absolutely at the time it was fun mm -hmm. but i didn't realize the more i was doing it it was not just about fun it was about suppression yeah but because Afterwards, I wasn't really getting the highs that I should have been getting. I stopped. Okay. Then I turned to overeating because eating was easy. Coming from a culture where always, you know, there's abundance of food, constant celebration, constant, you know, so many parties, people coming to eat. It's easy to overeat. Then I was sneaking in food into my room because I was constantly hungry. There was junk food, you know. Mm hmm Um, and I could hide the crisp packets and put them in my school bag. And then when I walk to school, I can put them in the bin, you know, so no one would know. Yes. Of course, at this point, the weight is now piling on. So not only am I listening to words like ugly and things now, it's fat, useless, worthless. Why do you mean useless? Because as, cult as my community and culture, not just my culture as well, like as women, so much pressure to look a certain way, especially thin, So where I wasn't thin and I was very curvy, it was almost like that pressure to be this beautiful woman. I wasn't that beautiful woman because from the age of 10, it was doctrined in me where who's going to marry you? Who's going to look at you? You've got no prospects. You're not going to get a job because of the way you look. You're not going to date because of the way you look. Was this a feeling or were also people t no, saying No, this is it? what was being told. So By whom? By my family. Oh, that's so... Yeah, like my grandparents that I grew up with. So because that was now filtered in. Yes. And coming from a South Asian culture, marriage was everything, you know. Yeah. Yeah, Over, I never yeah. even thought about marriage at that age. I'm 10. I don't even like boys at that no. stage. And they're telling you like... <laughs> yeah, already you told gonna end me. Up, like you didn't even maybe kiss the boy or something. Yeah, yeah, and they already told me there's no hope. Oh my God. So I've already believed that to be true yes so of course my self-esteem is chipping away a bit by bit coming from somebody who was really confident to now I was I was not confident at all externally if you saw me you would never guess inside there was pain you'd yes. think my oh god Tulsi you over this wow look how amazing I smiled my way through life so no one would have guessed so where the the weight was piling on Of course, the emotions were getting deeper and they were suppressed more and more and more and more. I've gone off to Guernsey to do work. So that was really an amazing experience. Mm -hmm. um, being independent, living in a different country, even though it's part of the UK. But when I come back, and now I'm not getting the jobs. I was getting rejection from the jobs. When Was there a lot of rejection? There was a lot of rejection. Yeah. There was walking down you know the main high street here in um in london oxford street so at the time you know when you're young you do retail work yeah just so handing out cvs and um you watch them rip the cvs and put them in the bin oh my god you you saw that you can happening. see that from the window and or if some of them did it right there and then 
Yes. Sorry, we haven't got a job, rip it and put it in the bin. Oh my God, that's so ugly to do. It was really bad. Yeah. And then I see other girls or even, well, guys walking in and handing CVs and they're like, great, we'll get back to you. And I see that. And yet I had to either grown up and accept that. So, of course, the more that was happening, you can imagine the self-esteem was getting even worse. You know, There was no worth, obviously, feeling useless. Even I can't even get a job. Like, what is wrong with me? Vision. The weight is piling on. That is going on. I now start a, a, another college course in health and social care. Because initially I went into um, hotel management because I love the idea of traveling. Yes. So I thought I'd love a job in hotel management. Um, but anyway, I changed to health and social care. And then I had a really good friend. And she said to me one day, which changed a lot of things, was, I'm concerned about your health. So rather than saying to me, I'm concerned about you putting on weight or you've put on weight, she actually said, I'm concerned about your health. That's where I started to make some changes in that I went to a gym. Mm -hmm. Now, going to a gym is not the answer, of course, to everything, but it it was all I knew at the time. Put my heart and soul into working out. I didn't see big dramatic changes, but I started to feel good. Yeah. Then um, I heard about Pilates at the time. And because in the magazines, it was like a fashion fad at the time. You know, Madonna was doing it and all these celebs. And I read into it and I was like really fascinated with Pilates. Anyway, at the gym, they had a class. And the instructor at the time, I didn't know... She was covering someone else. She had such a warm pers um, persona about her. So I did this class and there was an exercise and she said, you know, lift your leg off the ground. And in my head, I was. But my body didn't move, my leg didn't move. And there was a, a young, a, an older guy and he was doing it with ease. And I was like, what's wrong with me? Mentally, I'm strong, but physically, I wasn't. Because, of course, you know, all that weight I put on, wasn't exercising. Yeah. So I did Pilates and then obviously I was embarrassed. But I said to her, do you do one-to-one? -one? And she said, yeah. So she used to come to my house. That's so beautiful. Yeah, and we, we did training and I got stronger. And it was amazing. Yeah. And now I felt confident. I had a, a relationship at the time. A, a young man who was interested in me. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, this is great. Yeah, did great for my self-esteem. Yes. We saw past the burns. Saw past the story. But obviously, there was a huge age gap. How old was he? He was 18 at the time, and I was 24. He was 18? 18. 18, oh, yeah. he was younger. He was younger. I understand. But yeah. we just had a lovely connection. Yeah. And then in my head, I just put my heart and soul into this relationship. I didn't see it for just the fun that it was, which it was. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we broke up. It, it wasn't together long. But that, that pain I felt, the heartbreak, is almost that rejection all over again. Yes. But what I do with rejection is I put myself into something productive when I get, when I feel that way. Yeah. So I put myself through a degree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Put my energy into a degree. Okay. Um, Which is better than using of alcohol course. or no, drugs. Of course. Yeah. yeah, that's what I do. So how old were you at this age? So I was about fourteen when I started sort of the alcohol because it's yes. fun drinking and then trying coke and heroin and things like that. Oh, also heroin. Heroin, yeah. Oh, that's, are you addicted? Yeah, no, so, well, I think I've done it three times. Mm -hmm. But, like, I think I've got that thing. If it doesn't bring me joy, I don't continue it. Okay. Which Good for is you. saving grace. Yeah. Um, because I, th I thought I would become, to be fair. But after that high and then the low came, I'm like, I don't enjoy this. Okay. So, like I said, at the end of a coke line, all of that, there was no joy. You were 14 using the drugs. <coughs> Yeah, that's 14, such a young 15, age, right? Yeah, and it was, again, discreet. No one would know because mm -hmm. I kept it together. Yeah, and also because there was maybe nobody looking out for... Yeah. Like, so, yeah. And and because we were suppressing the emotion from the substance abuse, so no one thought any different. Yes. Smiled my way through. That sort of stopped around 15, 16. Then I did sort of weed, like cannabis, again... No joy, but it was just there. Anyway, so that sort of stopped. But as that stopped, food aspect increased. Yes. But along with that came shopping addiction as well. Oh. So spending money, lots and lots of money consistently to make myself feel good. 
and then splashing out money on other people, gifting. But, you know, the thing is, when you, the more you buy, you're still not going to be happy, do you know? Yeah, it's all external. It's all external. So 500 of this same outfit just because I could. Mm -hmm. They're the same things I'm now giving away or selling. Yes. Um, and I'd buy things that weren't even my size. You know, that's the joke thing. <laughs> so there was just an addiction. So there was one thing after another. My thing now is I'm not looking for a replacement. So just because I stopped this doesn't mean I need to replace this. Yes. It, it means I don't need it anymore. At this point, did you have any people around you with, like, also burned or scars or? Yeah. So when I left hospital, because um, I was a young child, there wasn't any facilities after. Once yes. you're discharged, you're discharged. And when you go in the community, I'm sure you don't, every person you meet doesn't have burns, right? So it's not. It's not a usual. It's not a usual yeah. thing. So I didn't meet anyone. And when you go hospital, you, you have your appointment and you come back. You know, you don't, there's not a social group. No. So I didn't connect. There was a Burns Club now for children. But culturally, I couldn't access it because I did go for the first year. But my grandparents were very much from that. Well, you don't need to go to this now. There's no benefit. Okay. So they didn't take me. So I then had to kind of deal with it on my own. Mm -hmm. So yeah, meet this adult burn sort of support. I'm seeing people with burns and, okay, I'm more advanced in my journey, meaning I'm now, what, 20, I think it was 23 years post-accident at this point. And I'm meeting people who might have had the burns quite recently yes. or whatever. But suddenly, we're not talking about our burns. We're talking about our dreams, our ambitions, our goals, just everyday things which were taken away from us. And to feel like a person again. And it was amazing. But it sounds so beautiful. It is amazing. Yes. When people used to say to me, Tulsi, you're so beautiful, I couldn't see it because all I saw was scars. Mm -hmm. When people saw me and they said, you're beautiful, I couldn't see. I'm like, what are you seeing that's beautiful? Is it my eyelashes? Is it, you know, my hands? What? Like, I, I get it. They could see the beauty, but I couldn't. But when I could see the beauty in my peers, I started to slowly see that in myself. Yeah, that's beautiful. Slowly. Yeah. When step I looked in step. the mirror, I was like, oh, I like that part of your nose. And oh, I like my eyes. Oh, I like this. Yeah. You know, I could start seeing things. That's when my relationship with my burns and my confidence changed. Yes. It's so positive to hear that at this point, meeting other people with the same, maybe certain same stories. And it really helped your confidence. Um, so how is it like now in the world, like... You also talked, I, I, I read this about you, talked about like the film industry, people, they're using people with scars uh, more for the, like the scary type of persons. Mm -hmm. How, yeah, what is your opinion about this? Yeah, so I'm, a, I'm an ambassador for a charity, um, Changing Faces UK. So we campaigned to have better representation in the fashion, media, TV, you know, popular culture. Because growing up, being called Freddy Krueger, you know, I didn't know Freddy Krueger was a villain mm -hmm. until I came home and, and I boasted to my uncle, I got called Freddy Krueger, like, and I thought it's somebody cool. And he got really angry. He's like, do you know who Freddy Krueger is? I was like, no. He goes, do you remember that film Nightmare on Elm Street and that baddie with the guy with Burns, the one who kills people? And I was like, yeah. He goes, that's what they're calling you. Oh, that's so sad. And yeah. I'm not the only one who's experienced that children with different visible differences have been called different names and adults so this campaign came about for better representation in the film and tv industry why is it that a villain has to have a scar or some sort of visible difference if there's no backstory yes why can't somebody be a love interest or someone in the background has a visible difference and they don't need to have a story but they're in the film or the TV. Yes. And also on like the good side, like it's always, most of the time, people with uh, visible differences playing the, the bad characters. Absolutely. And it's so... It's sad. And it's lazy script writing. Yes. It's one, you wear one script writing away from a positive representation. So I was part of a campaign. It was about the recent James Bond film. Yes. That came out. So we relaunched a campaign. Um, I'm not your villain. And we all got to dress up as um, amazing uh, film 
characters. So I got to be Holly Golightly in uh, from picture. Breakfast and Tiffany. Yes. What a dream! Because a girl growing up, I could never imagine myself in a film because someone like me can't be in a film. Someone like me, you know, can't look like that being in a film. But I got to dress up like that character, so it's possible. Somebody dressed up as James Bond. Somebody dressed up as Indiana Jones. You know, there's so many characters. So the thing is, we can do this, but it's lazy script writing. This is where we shape how people think. How does a young child know? Go, er, mummy, look at her. She's ugly. Yeah. How do they know what ugly looks like if we if they haven't seen it somewhere? I never equated having a visible difference as a negative character in a film. I didn't put the two and two together until we did this campaign and realizing we're so programmed with this already growing up. We don't even question it. No, it's so true. Yeah. It's so normal. Even for me, it was normal. Yeah. I didn't even put the two and two together. Yeah, it's all because of the films and everything we saw yeah. see at a young age. It's just doctrine dinner. Like it's yeah. just what we've grown up. So to change that is so powerful. The campaign was fantastic. You know, I get to do a, a most amazing campaigns, done like Visible Hate, where I again I didn't know I could report a hate crime. Yeah, and I didn't know that because yeah, it is like if you report it, it's like. So it's reported, you know, I didn't know. So I was part of a campaign to actually help people who do suffer this, that they can report it. Or say, example, you're with me and you experience it. You can report it. Yes. I didn't know that. So now that's what was important for our community mm -hmm. as well. So I do a lot of amazing campaigns. So again, you can imagine my confidence is growing. And also in this time, I'm getting to, to do more talks getting to share my story. I know why these things happen to me is so I can give other people inspiration, hope. So what is the, 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 the main key message you would like to give to all the people? The best thing I can give to anyone is be yourself. To be authentic is the greatest gift I can give you and the permission to be yourself. Because when you're yourself, you're not fighting anyone. You know, you're not seeking external validation. It's all from within. I'm my version of beautiful. I'm not anyone else's. So I don't care if you find me beautiful or not. I don't care if you call me beautiful or not. It doesn't make a difference. I know I am. I'm my version though. I'm not the media's version or anyone. I'm mine. And if I can give that to any man or woman listening to this right now, that's what I would give. Find it within and that unique thing that you were once insecure about is actually your superpower mm -hmm. and if you can really harness that you are just living your true authentic self yeah that's beautiful so for all the listeners who maybe yeah struggle with their own story uh, what would your advice looking back at your life would be um i think the greatest thing i can always say is share your story When you share it once, it will feel really weird. It will feel like, you know, you've, you'll be carrying something. Oh, my God, well, I've shared something. You feel judged. You, know, you might feel ashamed, whatever you might be feeling about your story. But the more you share it, the less it's invading you. Because it's like, it's like a poison almost. If it's stored within your body, it will fester in the body. Yes. When it's out of your body, you have no control over it. It has no control over you, sorry. So the more you share it, the lighter it is. Doesn't mean you just share it here, there, and everywhere. You might you might write about it, you might sing about it, you might even draw, you might speak, I don't know. Whatever it is, it needs an outlet. Mm -hmm. And the more you share your story with other people, not only are you inspiring them, but you're giving yourself self-love because now you're giving yourself permission to heal from those traumas, from those stigma, from the judgment from whatever held you back um, and whatever ashamed or guilt feeling you may have, it's giving you healing. Yes. Thank you so much for sharing your story and coming to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Yeah, more than welcome. Nice meeting you. Too. <laughs> Thank you all for listening to Days for Fives. Let us know what you think of this episode. If you're inspired by this unique and extraordinary survival story, please follow or subscribe to our podcast and check out our social media for more stories like these.
Until next time, take care and don't miss the next episode. When I flip the lights on, I've got John Kearns dead on my floor in my living room. What are you going to do? How are you going to get rid of the body? I don't know. You know, she's like, well, why don't you know? His wife killed him. The capsule she gave him had potassium cyanide in it. And uh, says, I'm going to give you a 15-minute window where I'm going to offer you a one-time, one-time deal only to save your wife's life. She runs off with him and my son two weeks after I get out, and I never hear from her again. I'm here to do my time, my time only. I want to go home. And the governor said, I took it because I could. And then the court said, well, that's good enough for us. That was probably the worst part for me because at that time I thought, I'm getting out.